Aspiration and the Pulmonary Biome, a Clinical Framework for Dysphagia Management, from Phyllis Palmer and Aaron Padilla. So what do we do with all this information? What do we do with the bolus? All this stuff that we're talking about today. We created two case studies for discussion that we're going to talk by side by side. The first is a young gentleman who's 36 years old. He was uh, previously uh, pre-morbidly independent and healthy, unremarkable medical history. He's now a uh, 10 day status post TBI. He's been NPO since that TBI. He's currently at Rancho level five. He does have a robust voluntary cough with adequate vocal quality. He does have good oral health, um, but he's unable to um, perform oral care. He has a very strong support system that can help assist with that. We did an instrumental swallow assessment and found aspiration on liquids with no attempt to eject the PS of eight. Uh, the reason of the aspiration was uh, delayed laryngovascular closure, and the amount of aspiration was neither trace nor gross. We're going to compare this gentleman to an 85 year old non ambulatory female who resides in a long term care facility. She has pretty significant COPD, which requires oxygen and daily oral prednisone. She's dependent for all of her activities of daily living, has a history of poor oral hygiene, and is dependent on others to perform her oral care. We note that she has intermittent gurgly vocal quality and a weak cough. She doesn't really have any support system except for the staff at the long-term care facility. In a video flora, we see that she has trace aspiration across all liquid consistencies. She attempts to eject and those attempts are unsuccessful. So a PAS score of seven. The aspiration is due to incomplete closure of the laryngeal vestibule. And we see a lot of inefficiencies throughout the system on all textures, meaning that she's got lots of residue after the swallows. Using the bolus framework, we are going to assess risk by using stoplights, where green implies a very low risk and red implies a very high risk of an adverse event. So first, let's look at bolus variables. So the first patient here is he aspirating uh, thick or dense material. Well, right now he's NPO, but we did have some of the um, you know, liquids aspirated on the video floor. The same uh, concept for the highly acidic material MPO right now, but potential for that. But we can modify that, you know, maybe stay away from the highly acidic stuff. Um, and he is not aspirating the large volumes at, at the moment. While our elderly lady is aspirating all liquids, regardless of density and also regardless of acidity, she's only aspirating trace amounts. Next, let's look at um, oral health for these patients. Uh, you know, this patient does need assistance with the oral care, and his oral care is, um, you know, pretty good at baseline, but then he has that excellent support system. Not too worried about that for this gentleman. We'll be able to compensate until he's hopefully able to do it on his own. For this lady, we see that she does have evidence of poor oral care and she is dependent on others for her oral care routine. And we don't really know much about her saliva based on the history, but with her age, we're assuming that there's probably some compromise in saliva production. Next level of activity and lifestyle. So again, this gentleman pre-morbidly, um, you know, pretty, pretty healthy. He's, you know, improving his mobility now that he's post TBI working with physical therapy. He's not frail or deconditioned, so he should have a, a good host response. Um, he is dependent on others for, for oral care right now, but again, good support system, as well as for the feeding that we can do some, some really good uh, family training there. So unlike our gentleman, where most of the lifestyle aspects were modifiable, our lady is less modifiable. So she has limited mobility and she's been uh, non-ambulatory for a while. She's deconditioned and frail. She's dependent on others for oral care. She's dependent on assistance for feeding. So just to put nugget on this framework, although they're yes, no questions, the way we would like for everyone to think about them is yes, but, or no, but, and that's where the modifiable and non-modifiable piece comes in. So the unintended or atrogenic influences here, um, he does not have tubes that harbor bacteria other than the current nasal gastric tube modifiable in the sense that we can uh, pull that and, uh, you know, decrease the bacteria. And then he's also off of mechanical 
ventilation. There may be some dysbiosis to the pulmonary system, but you know it would be greater if you had a tracheotomy tube and was receiving the mechanical ventilation continuously um, while we were assessing. Currently, Our Lady is not on any tubes, nor is she receiving mechanical ventilation. So lastly, we have system health. We know that this gentleman is in good overall general health. He does have some cognitive function that's diminished. Our hope is that we would be able to have that improve. He does not have any decreased respiratory function, respiratory disease. He has a very strong, robust cough. He does not have any uh, gastric GI disease, and he does not have a compromised immune function. So overall, a pretty healthy guy, and we'll talk about him a little bit more as a group of how we would move forward with this patient. So our lady, again, being less modifiable, she's in poor general health. Her cognitive function is compromised and her respiratory function is greatly limited as a result of her COPD. We don't know if she has GERD, but based on her age, we're assuming there must be at least some of that. Again, based on her age, we assume there's some compromise in immune function. So now let's reconsider our BOLUS framework. And I'd like to ask the audience, what would you, how would you use this framework to guide your decision? What, would you feed this guy or not? Let's see. Jessica oh. said, feed the young man. Feed the young man. <laughs> I like that. So one vote for feeding the young man. Not sure about the 86 year old lady. Um, I would feed the gentleman with the TBI and not the older woman. Agree. So it looks like overall the agreement, would you say, Aaron? Yeah, yeah. Is that, uh, oh, oh, interesting. I would feed both depending on the desires. I love that they took into effect, into consideration what the person wants. Thank you. Yes, yes What yes. does the person want? Particularly an 86-year-old, she, assuming that, assuming your patient has adequate cognitive function, they have the right to decide if they want to eat or not eat, as long as they under, can understand the risks associated with it. But based on the bolus framework, it looks like people are saying that they want to um, feed the gentleman and maybe less so feed the lady. So if we think about their scorecard for B, for bolus volume, they're both about the same. They have some limitations. For oral care, his oral care is modifiable and he had pre-morbidly good oral care. She did not. Lifestyle, again, his is modifiable. Hers less so, iatrogenic risks. He's got some because he's got the two, but that is again, a modifiable short-term thing. So we hope that that won't be a long-term issue. And system status, before his accident, he was quite healthy. So he was doing well, whereas our little old lady has had some long-term compromise. So using this scorecard, we might lean towards feeding the gentleman, even though his aspiration was a higher level than hers, we might feed him and we might not feed her, depending on what we thought the level of risk was acceptable. One of the things I want you to think about when you're looking at the bolus framework is it's a shift to a patient-centered care and consideration of the patient. What does the host bring to the management decision? I think, I think on that note, something to say is um, we hope that the bolus is very useful in the clinic and serving patients in the future, but we also want to give some caution of it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Our, our, our aim is that it's something very individualistic, and we'll look at each uh, patient with a very special lens, a different lens for each patient, and that's the goal of the bolus. Not one-size-fits-all, but something that is unique to each patient. And when can we modify those things? When can we not? And most importantly, as we had a member of our audience share uh, today, is we want to um, make sure that we're discussing these things, not only with the medical team, but also with the patient as well. So we can participate in multicultural patient-centered shared decision-making and make the best decision moving forward for the patient so they can have the best outcome that they choose to proceed with. Thank you for your time. For those of you who are in the ASHA presentation, this is not really live, so you can't talk to us in chat, but you can reach us via email, and here's our email addresses, and we will entertain your questions and look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. All right.